everyone it's Ross and today I want to give you guys a little bit of a tour um, we're now in the fall and the last tour I did for you guys was in the spring early summer and uh, that way you guys can go back and see what things looked like then I like to go back it's nice for you know taking notes um, go back to previous videos see what things looked like see how tur things turned out um, at the end of the season so I'm going to go over mostly um, the entire yard, the entire property. I'm going to skip over a lot of the fig stuff because I feel like I've showed you guys a lot of that. But uh, we'll start here at the figs. And we've been getting a lot of rain, guys. Um, I was in fig heaven for most of the season, but now we have uh, really the late season figs coming in now. Or just now starting from about September 15th onwards. That's when they kind of begin. And you can see figs here like uh, Italian 258, just splitting everywhere. And the problem with them splitting is that the rain gets in the in the fig guys, and then that attracts bugs because the the rain ferments the sugars, and that it brings in all kinds of things. So that's why I have these organza bags on here to help with that. But uh, these figs really are not going to do all that well. I have a lot of picking to do. Anything that's really split is just not going to do well at all. Whereas other figs somehow have held up to this rain quite well. This fig right, right down here called Zafiro hasn't split. Actually tastes quite good in the rain. So it's interesting to find out, even though we've had lots of rain recently, what does well and what doesn't do well. Um, and it's also nice to have other things in your yard that like the rain. You know, so figs, uh, one of those things that doesn't like the rain, pomegranates, similar story. But um, my che, I think, is probably drying out a little bit, along with most of the potted plants that I have along this this area here. Uh, when the things dry out, <laughs> they either drop their fruit or they die. And I think in this case, uh, you know, a couple of them have been dying here on the end. These are some apple trees. And uh, it's not a huge deal, but lesson learned. Um, I think what I need to do is that, because the figs don't really like a whole lot of water, they don't need a whole lot of water, I'm gonna put these guys on a separate, a separate line. So let me show you this down here. But you can see that line down there. I can basically direct the water where I want it and where I don't. And then that way I can either adjust these emitters here, put in more emitters, or I can just have a separate line completely for this whole planting. Even the pomegranates should probably be on a different line than the figs because the figs, I'm only giving them about eight ounces of water per five gallons of soil. But for the most part, they've all done really well and grown super well. I mean, that one, a couple of these plum trees here, I didn't think they were on standard rootstocks. I think they're only on semi-dwarfs, but they're growing extremely quickly. Um, those are at least 15 feet tall. Those are about as tall as my damn peaches almost. And the peaches grew really well this year. They put out 100 fruits apiece. You can see there's some new greener, light greener growth here that's uh, indicating that they are still growing. We did a little bit of summer pruning on these guys. I definitely recommend summer pruning on a couple uh, different species of trees, but you know, we made a cut here and a cut over here. And what that did was kind of open up the middle of the tree, uh, or I should say the two trees, because I want these, these limbs down here, because they're going horizontally, I want them to grow upwards into that space. So that's been the goal. Below we have shallots that we planted really only 60, 45 days ago. And they're doing really well. Uh, my friend Brian gave me these in Louisiana. Uh, my friend Scott in Colorado gave me these uh, walking onions and they're doing really well. We've even um, taken the heads off of the walking onions. I did a different video on this guys. To put the heads of the walking onions where I wanted them. And it's really well, it's really great because um, I even be able to put them over here. You can see I have a whole walking onion thing forming here. And I love green onions, but you can also dig up the onion itself, the bulb underneath the ground. Here's another one here. And you can dig that up, guys, and eat the, the, uh, the bulb as well. But I think they 
are really tasty with the tops and the the stems used as green onions. But uh, this whole area here, and I've recommend, I've asked you guys in a previous video what I should do with this area. I've come to the conclusion I should put a nice bed in here uh, for flowering plants and, and pollinating plants to help bring in more bees. Especially earlier in the season, I think it's definitely beneficial for things like my apples and my stone fruits that are sitting right here, you know, to get that early pollination. And it seems like maple trees are the best way to get in early pollinators and um, clovers. And um, God, what's that weed that comes in all the time, guys? It's so annoying. <laughs> what is it? This thing here. Ugh, my grandfather calls it Jacodia. The hell is this? I forget. I'm sure you know what that is. I just am blanking on the name. But anyway, this thing here, this raised bed, uh, did really well for me this year. We got a pretty good amount of vegetables out of this. Huge amounts of basil. We made so much pesto. In fact, this one here, I'm going to cut this down pretty soon to make the remainder of this and the other basil we have on the other side of the yard into more pesto. The fennel, I'm really happy with because I love fennel now, I've realized. It's great. Uh, I've made a lot of... Uh, dishes actually on your recommendations i did a video on the fennel guys and i the biggest thing i did or the the best thing i made was the fennel um plus sausage plus uh plus i did uh potatoes and onions and garlic uh with some pasta and all that together it's a really nice italian dish that i love we have some late season corn we also have some things like direct seeded in here which is coming out really well uh, there was a period of time where I was direct seeding things over here uh, in the form of brassicas, but my brassicas who, that have been here for pretty much all season have got decimated by whitefly. And it really, really stinks because um, I think there's a period of time in my season now that I'm learning, you can't grow brassicas in like the middle of the summer. Even if they will, you know, will survive and they won't bolt, it's just not a good idea. I think a nice resting period between the spring and the fall is a really good idea. So things like broccoli rob, not the greatest idea. Oh, that was another thing I add to the fennel dish was broccoli rob. But the figs back here did really well. Um, they could have grown a lot more, but I, I had a pretty bad scale infestation on these. You can see this is a uh, Noir de Barbantine who has a fig on it, which is pretty cool. A couple of these had figs on them, but uh, the scale, I think, really detrimented them and put them back. This is a really dry, warm area, and the scale thrived in that. Uh, but next year, and this, I should say, this dormancy period, I'm going to spray these guys with a dormant oil on all of my figs to wipe out that scale. Down here, we have garlic coming up, and I planted this garlic early. I'm doing this as a bit of an experiment. We have more garlic on the other side here where my pastelary fig is. That garlic we planted in the beginning of September, like September 1st. And then some of these now that are coming up down there, I know it's tough to see, but right down in here, guys, is some new garlic. That was planted September 15th. And then I have tons more varieties coming in the mail. Um, also some that I stored and cured myself. Some that I got from New York Garlic Guy, if you're watching. We're gonna plant out a bunch of that stuff. Um, actually, New York garlic guy, your garlic's planted right here. We planted this on the 15th of September, I believe. Yeah, so that one didn't come up yet, but some of these actually did. And I think actually maybe this might be the September 1st planting. And then this guy on the end is actually August 15th. So we're really trying, I know that garlic doesn't survive the winter, guys, It's uh, unless it's small. So we're really trying something new here. Uh, I think if I can get my garlic through the winter time at a, a larger stage, I should get bigger bulbs. So we'll see what happens. But a bit of an experiment. I still have much more garlic to plant. And I'll plant that October 1st at the normal time. That way I guarantee myself uh, plenty of heads of garlic. But the tomatoes did really well as well. Same thing with the peppers, and I've talked about this stuff at pretty great length recently, so maybe I'll skip over it. But the peppers did really well vertically. 
the Jimmy Nardellos was a star because the Jimmy Nardello, I direct seeded them in the ground and they all put out about seven to eight ish peppers. Uh, some of which haven't ripened yet, but you can tell on this one little vine is seven peppers and we've already harvested one off of here. That one needs to be staked up by the way. But the vegetables have gone strong this year. I think we need to continue to improve and up our game to get better and better at it. I think every year it's a bit of a, a process, but here we have the honeyberries and the honeyberries fruit of formia was uh, as well this year. I got a nice taste of them. Um, and I did a video on these guys and the honeyberries, I have to say are a really, really tasty fruit. They don't grow all that much, uh, after they fruit. So they grow a lot while they're fruiting in the beginning of the year. And then when they're done fruiting at some time around June or July, then they'll stop growing for the rest of the season. And you may look at the plant and be like, what the hell's wrong with my plant? But that's just what it does, right? I, I don't know. But I'm expecting these guys, because they've been storing energy for so long this year, I'm expecting most of them to get to about four feet tall by four feet wide by this time next year. And then the year prior, the year after that, I should say, uh, we'll have a huge crop of honeyberries. Next year I'll get a pretty good crop, but I think two years from now is when it really will start. My European grapevines, we got hit with a lot of black rot this year, and I've talked about on Instagram or Facebook, if you follow me there, you know that I'm going to use this product this year to help fight against black rot. It's called Spectracide Immunox. It's not organic, but um, it seems like a really good choice because I only have to spray it once. And you basically spray the spectricide. When the new canes that come out of the, the vine here are about a foot long, six inches to a foot long, uh, that's before the fruit forms. And then that way it clears the disease along these canes here. And that really helps. Uh, I've been told by a friend in the area who it completely eliminates a lot of the disease. So we'll see what happens. Here we have uh, rosemary, and I think I'm going to just let this rosemary go. Historically, I've cut the whole thing down at the base, and I've dried it inside. I've had rosemary all year round for cooking. I love cooking with rosemary, but I think that kills the plant. So we're going to leave it here, hopefully get it through the wintertime. This is a more hardy variety called ARP, A-R-P. We have the, uh, the mint here. It's really going crazy, so we're going to cut this back pretty extreme. Try to get up as many rhizomes as I can, which isn't really that difficult because the soil in here has so many wood chips, so many layers of wood chips that it's very loose back here, and pulling up any kind of roots is actually very easy. But we also have down here, before I forget about it, a new method of planting potatoes we're going to do this year. The potatoes are already in the ground. We cover this with straw. The potatoes overwinter here as if it's like a refrigerator, or something like that. And then they naturally will sprout for me without me having to do anything. You cover them with straw, and this is a really nice method uh, for basically getting lots of potatoes. They don't get green this way. Um, the straw helps with uh, mounding up the soil. It's also pretty cheap. So I've seen a lot of people in a lot of videos, people doing it this way. And I think I'll have a nicer uh, crop that way. So we'll see what happens. But the apple trees in this corner are growing quite well. Uh, they got hit with some disease. You can see that here. But the new growth is pristine, looking real good. Um, and I've just been piling on the mulch, guys, on these dwarf apple trees. These guys are only supposed to get... 12 feet tall at most they're probably already 12 feet tall so I'm thinking next year they probably will fruit quite heavily for me and what that will do is really slow down the vigor of these trees uh, but the the mulch here is really adding in lots of fertility I want them to get bigger I kind of wish they weren't on dwarf rootstock to be honest with you we're gonna put another dwarf apple tree planting right here where my foot is and kind of just squeeze this in this little corner here and then back behind me is going to be muscadine grapes that we're going to put in. Two varieties that I've found uh, through research to be quite hardy. Lane and Triumph go down to negative 10 degrees with no problems for certain individuals. So 
that's really important and that's the main reason why you can't grow muscadines here in Pennsylvania but apparently you can now so that's pretty cool we planted all kinds of things um, in this little area of the yard if you just saw the video that I I put out on this topic about planting trees um, you know talking about what's going to go over here in this little section of the yard you guys can go back and and uh, and learn about that I just kind of want to show it to you and then that way you guys if you're really interested in this section of the yard can really just go back and see what's going on um, I do want to mention that we planted a kiwi vine here hardy kiwi this was in like uh, early summer and they did actually quite grow quite well it already got to the top of the wire that was my goal for the year um, I'm hoping I can get this to go down this way maybe a little bit and then the next year it should very easily reach the ends of the wire and from then on send out new growth that will come out towards us and come out towards the other direction similar to my grapevines same thing with the this is a jostaberry so the jostaberry actually uh, we got this at the same time we got the kiwi vine and this guy's growing quite well for how small it was when I got it and the same thing with the male kiwi vine back here which is in a lot of shade on purpose because uh, I kind of want to control this vine get it up this pole attach it to this tree and then eventually remove this pole all right so let's go to the other side of the yard guys I kind of want to keep this as short as I can but uh, for the most part there's a lot of things that did well and there's a lot of things that didn't so what you're looking at here is a bed that didn't do well <laughs> and this guy I have a few uh, there's a few reasons why one the fertility is not here there's a shade tree behind me it's actually quite tall quite vigorous that puts its roots into this bed really stopped a lot of uh, things from getting nutrients um, there's also a lot of peat moss in this bed which is completely just it has no nutrients in it so there's just a lot of uh, a lack of fertility here also we didn't water this thing and I, you can see the irrigation system I have hooked up here that works perfectly we actually direct seeded some uh, vegetables in here some fall crops of like different types of lettuces like spinach and arugula we did beets uh, I think we did maybe turnips we did a couple things so this should come out quite well I hope by the end of the season we also have a bucket here this is set up to attract fruit flies and if you hit it maybe do a little bit of inspecting uh, the fruit fly population in my yard has certainly gone down so that's really really uh, cool and I think very much so overlooked and a lot of people when they have a pretty bad SWD infestation they kind of freak out a little bit some of this here we need to pick this is a pink brandy wine my absolute favorite tomato and they didn't come out that well this year because of this bed but it's a shame but you know it is what it is you learn from our lessons um, a lot of our melons over here got hit with fusarium wilt same thing with the cucumbers the corn on the end that we had didn't do all that well either because uh, it just wasn't there wasn't enough water it didn't grow very quickly it was a mess guys this strawberry bed has done phenomenally and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna take out a bunch of strawberry plants because there's just too many I think it's a little crowded uh, I'd rather have less strawberries that get a bit more light that maybe get a bigger size less picking that way they don't, I don't want them to crowd the figs either because they're kind of shading the soil which is making the soil a little bit cooler that's not what I want um, so we need to do that and I think what I'll do is I'll rip up some of these strawberry plants and put them in bundles how the nurseries do them in the fall maybe even in the winter time and then I can sell those strawberry plants or even give them away to friends because these really do perform exceptionally well so We have a bunch of figs, guys, that we put in the ground this year, and that's a big thing of what's going to happen next year. This is Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross, and this is Ronde de Bordeaux. 
Um, some of this is a bit of an experiment, but you can see that these two trees are actually planted on a mound. They're above grade. Uh, whereas my LSU purple here that I showed you guys on video and how to plant this, this is not on a mound. This is, if it is on a mound, it's on a very slight mound and only really a little bit of the, yeah, I mean, most of the, the active growing buds or the, the dormant buds are actually underneath the soil. So not a whole lot of this is above grade, but the root ball here on the Ron de Bardot and the root ball here on the Colonel Littman's Black Cross is above grade, at least a portion of it. And I think this is going to help me rather than hurt me. And a lot of people are telling me that my tree is going to die. Um, but I've already done this. I've already successfully got these trees through the wintertime. Not, the, not these two in particular, but to go back over here. This is my hardy Chicago. And we have a Maltese Falcon there and a JH Adriatic. The three of them I planted last October in the ground. And... I would say about four to six inches of the root ball is above grade. And I've purposely went through here, dug through the soil to see where the root ball was, and uh, they're all above grade. So people that tell me that my tree is going to die, I, I don't want to say they don't know what they're talking about, but uh, to me this is a better way to do it. So uh, the safe way to do it is to plant the thing deeper. but. I'd rather have my trees thrive than survive. Survival's not enough for me in these in the ground. It just here in this climate, a tree in the ground to have it not thrive, it doesn't make sense. I'd rather just grow it in a container, you know? If this thing's going to grow every year and just grow and grow and grow and that's it, what's the point? We also have a tree in a raised bed, and you can see the Taramo unknown that I put in a raised bed has grown a crazy amount. Um, I even took off a nice air layer off the bottom here that had a ton of growth coming out this way. So the tree was huge. Uh, it's amazing what happens when you put a tree like this, a five gallon size fig, you put it in a raised bed, and then the roots go into the soil and then it has the excess heat from being raised. And that's kind of what I'm trying to replicate here with those figs over there, is I'm trying to get those to grow an insane amount because with all that excess heat, they have a way higher metabolism, just way higher. So that's the goal. And uh, we'll see if this tree survives, then those tree will, trees will definitely survive, right? Because this is two feet off the ground. So a bit of an experiment going on here, but um, really not the end of the world. Uh, this, this tomato plant here, I wanna point out because this is a sun gold, which looks like it's getting hit with Fusarium wilt right now. This side of the yard gets it real bad. But this sun gold tomato, guys, puts out better tasting, more abundant, more split resistant tomatoes than sun gold. It's better, it's better than sun gold. And guess how I planted this? This was a volunteer. We just put a bunch of tomatoes back here in this bed. And we put some over here behind the, uh, the raspberries and the blackberries. So, I don't know guys, it's a bit of a myth if you ask me. I know they're not true to type if they're hybrid, but this one was better than the hybrid that was already created. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, guys, I want to talk more about this video or give you more on this tour, but we're kind of running low on space. So I'm going to come back to you guys tomorrow. We'll do the second part of this tour, and then we'll end it right there. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoy this one. Take care.